โอ้แบนจะถึงโอ้นักเคลื่อนไหวกันต่อไปนะครับนี่คือเพลงเสียงจากโรงงานเพลงเสียงจากสถานีแสดงออกแห่งประเทศของโรงงานเพลงเสียงจากสถานีแสดงออกแห่งประเทศของโรงงานเพลงเสียงจากสถานีแสดงออกแห่งประเทศของโรงงานเพลงเสียงจากสถานีแสดงออกแห่งประเทศของโรงงานเพลงเสียงจากสถานีแสดงออกแห่งประเทศของโรงงาน I'm Charlie Baglin, and we go inside outdoors all the way back to 1976 with the homegrown talents of Fiddlin' Edgar Smith. In the hollers of Lee County, Kentucky, Edgar never made a real album. He made real friends, and one of them was a little grade school kid to whom he taught the basics of outdoor life as only an old timer could. Lessons learned, the companionship lost. Until a little white cassette tape surfaced, and what was on that old tape that Edgar had recorded? Is it really all that different from what's on old tapes we find ourselves in the backs of drawers, in old boxes in the basement? They are parts of our past, just like aging diaries and family photographs, but with a voice. Two voices that share a passion for the subject are on the program. They are from the Kentucky Historical Society's Oral History Commission. But in the first half hour, we reminisce with Hank Patton, who was that little boy. And while Mr. Patton is a grown man now, as he sits with me in the studio, he is still very much ten. We will be back in a moment. This is Kentucky Field Radio. Honey, what'd you get your brother? The Fish and Wildlife Gift Certificate. Fishing for ideas, hunting for gifts. Give the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Gift Certificate for the person on your list with the great outdoors on theirs. Online at fw.ky.gov. Dear Santa, you probably never expected to hear from an old fellow like me, but I too have a list. Some folks are coming to visit me. It's been quite a while since I've seen my son and. Grandson, they're always ripping and racing going someplace, but this Christmas they're just racing to see me. So, Mr. Kringle, let them arrive safe. That's all. A holiday wish for safe travels from your Kentucky office of Highway Safety. Christmas means deer season in more ways than one. Have the Jolly Reindeer drop off the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife gift certificate, perfect for anyone on your list who has hunting on theirs. Find it at fw.ky.gov. If life were a movie, it would have its own soundtrack. My name is Charlie Baglin, and thanks for joining us on a special episode of Kentucky Field Radio. For many of us, the soundtrack of our life may very well be found on an oldies radio station. The sounds from our past, the movies, old TV shows, but some recordings bring back the past like no other. And they are often found when we take the time to say, "Hmm, I wonder what is on that old cassette tape. I wonder what was recorded on that old reel-to-reel tape from Granddad's closet." That's what Hank Patton did, and I'm glad he did because he came to me asking my assistance to transfer to a CD from a brittle old cassette tape that he hadn't seen. Since his childhood, and it held a story that had to be told, because it's not just his story; it's a story that any one of us could relate to. I think we are listening to the music of Fiddlin' Edgar Smith. Who is Edgar Smith?、Uh, Edgar was a when I met him was about a seventy-five year old, five foot five inch, skinny as a rail, Eastern Kentucky mountain guy from, from Lee County, Kentucky. He was a retired Army veteran. Uh, he had lost three fingers on his right hand in World War II. My dad had met this gentleman trying to buy a piece of property. My dad had gone down to that area of the, of the Leco area trying to find a farm to buy, and Edgar had a piece of property he thought he might want to sell. And when we drove up to his house the first time we met him, he was skinning a rabbit that he'd shot out of his garden, and he had blood over both hands and a shotgun over his shoulder. 
And it kind of laughed at you. It makes a, a great impression on a seven-year-old young man like me at the time. Every third word out of Edgar's mouth was an explicative. <laughs> and we got to, got to just visit him with him and became very close friends. And he became a, a, quite a friend of my dad's at the time we lived in, in uh, eastern Kentucky. But we came over to Lee County to visit with him and found out that Edgar picked the banjo and played the mandolin. And he, after he was wounded in World War II, his actual job was going to pick with Chet Adkins as part of the USO tour that they did all the troops. When my dad found out about that, he said, well, you need to make us a tape. He said, well, I don't do that much except in the winter. And uh, Edgar was real bad. He had been afflicted by malaria. And in the winter, he'd go in his house, and it was a typical hoarder's home, had everything in the world he ever owned was right around him, he and his wife. And uh, Edgar sat down with an old cassette player, the old rectangular cassette player. He decided he was going to pick out a tune for my dad and make that tape he'd always talked about. I'm going to try to make that tape now. I want to make it for uh, all of you fellas. For Hank and Roxanne and Hanky and Barky and Rosie and her boyfriend and so forth. And okay? Okay. Well, in Smith, how was she found? Shot through the heart line, cold on the ground. Blood, it was scattered and cold on the ground. And blood marked the spot. isn't music you are going to download from iTunes on a daily basis. It is not featured on American Idol. It was never intended to have a world audience. You were that audience. He couldn't play the mandolin exactly the way he wanted to because he didn't have his last three fingers on his right hand. And to listen to this tape and to listen to the way he played that music was unbelievable that he could still do that. But his passion was playing that music. I had heard that tape when I was probably 10 or 11 years old. And my mother recently passed, and we were going through some of her things, and I found that cassette tape. And I played it one time in my vehicle radio, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to, I'm going to destroy this. I can't let this. I've got to get it some way I'll digitally put on something so I can, take, I, can, I can use it. And that's when I brought it to you, because I was so afraid to tear it up and, and, and lose it. He introduces the tape by saying a hello to Hank Roxine. That was my mother. Her name was Rostine, but he couldn't. He he always called her Roxine. He mentions Hanky. I uh, was that what my my mom called me when I was a kid. You are Hanky. Yep. And Rowena was my sister. And her boyfriend. That's it. And I don't know who that was at the time. <laughs> this was recorded in 1976, and you said yes. he was 75 or so, probably. Yes. At the time, I wonder if that cassette tape that turned into a CD is more appreciated today than it was all those years ago. Absolutely no question. When I heard it as a child, the song that I always remembered was Purple Robe. Uh, Edgar would never strike you as a religious man. Trust me, I, again, every third word was an explicative of some sort. But to hear him on this tape was almost a testament to the other side of him that you didn't know. And, and I, at, at 10, 11 years old, I wasn't capable of understanding that. Uh, to hear the tape after not seeing it for 30 years or 40 showed me a whole other side of this man that I held as a, as a hero in my life. And you're right, it means more to me now today than it ever did. Read the story so unkind in the holy book we find. It tells how Jesus stood alone one day. False to and condemned, yet they found no fault in him. That man who wore the scarlet purple robe. Purple robe, my Savior wore, oh, what shame for me he bore. I stood alone, forsaken on that day. 
and he placed upon his head piercing thorn of blood stained red. His raiment was a scarlet purple robe. This will likely be the only time you ever hear the music of Fiddlin' Edgar Smith on the radio. But similar recordings do exist. Christmas mornings, piano recitals, birthday parties, on a cassette tape, on an old reel-to-reel, somewhere in your home. Perhaps this program will nudge you towards digging them out, seeing what's hidden in there. In the case of our guest, it tells the story of how a little boy from Owsley County was introduced to the outdoors, a path that he followed all the way to the directorship of the Division of Law Enforcement with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. That's the group we call Conservation Officers. More when we return. My name is Charlie Baglin. This is Kentucky Field Radio. This is Kentucky Field Radio, and my name is Charlie Baglin. Hank Patton is my guest in this first half hour, and we are talking about gold mining, in a sense. The gold that is there to be mined from the old tapes and old reels that we find under our beds, in the backs of drawers, on shelves in the basement. And we're talking about an old tape that came back into Hank's life, recorded by an individual from Lee County, Kentucky, Fiddlin' Edgar Smith. Can you see him playing that banjo yes, now? Yes, sir. As clearly today as the day I first saw it. Where do you see him playing into this little microphone for the cassette deck? When you walked into his home, basically it was an eastern Kentucky home. It, it, it wasn't anything fancy, but it was home. But the thing that always intrigued me was, A, it was always so hot in that house during the winter because he had the malaria, and it was usually over 100 degrees. Uh, everything they owned, there were pathways through the floor and stuff, newspapers, magazines, boxes, trinkets, odds and ends were stacked to the ceiling. And he had an easy chair with a lamp beside of it. And I can see that table and that cassette recorder sitting on that lamp stand and him sitting there and plucking out a tune with it. That's it. I guess most people are lump it. Well, I think that's just about all 
tape or a room I have on this side of the tape, so I'll just turn it over and finish up on the other side, okay? Okay, dope. If it suits you, it does me. The fact that if there's room enough on this side of the tape, that talks about <laughs> how technology has changed. Recording media have changed. People today have, they, they don't have cassette decks. They don't walk around with real real recorders. In their pocket, they have a phone that will record birthday parties. And Would you agree that there is an absolute treasure trove in all of these recordings? Maybe not today, but in 20, 30, 40 years down the pike? Absolutely. I mean, look at, at, at what, you know, we've got more technology in our pocket now than, than was even available then. And and you see these folks who are out videoing their hunts or they're recording a, a, a fishing trip or something they're doing with their kids or with their with their family. And, you know, those things don't mean much at that time. But 30 years from now, what's that going to mean to you? Where does that take you back to then? And, and that's exactly what this state did. I think Edgar probably didn't imagine in 1976 that we'd be talking about this today. Probably wouldn't have wanted us to. <laughs> yeah, that's it, I see. <laughs> If you don't care what you say, it might be. My dogs are barking at me, and me is screwing the song up, and I don't know. <laughs> well, life goes on just the same, though. Here we go on another one. <clears throat> Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining so far through shadow dim. Light and light away, they're gone. Hiding with madmen from afar into the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining on. This is homespun music. This is Americana. This is Appalachia. This is Kentucky, long ago. Poor Ellen Smith. Black Mountain Rag. Beautiful Star of Bethlehem. We still hear some at Christmas. Old Cross Roads. Not crossroads, but cross roads, as in the crucifix. Little Maggie. Purple Robe, you mentioned. These, obviously, were his favorite songs. They were, absolutely by memory. If I remember watching him cut one of those songs, he had no music, just whatever came to him when it came to his mind. Memories are what they are. Some of them, they're very happy. Sometimes they bring back sad memories, sibling rivalries. You never know what memories are going to surface in these, but you seem to welcome every one of them. It was amazing the things that I remembered just and, and, and the nuances about Edgar. Edgar didn't have any running water. And every day he packed it to a spring. And it brought up the memories of me going up to that spring as a child and drinking out of a gourd dipper out of the spring. We didn't worry about being sick or something happening. Who knows? But uh, we got right down in the spring, and, and my first first squirrel was killed with Edgar, you know, with a 12-gauge shotgun. And I shot the gun, and I was so afraid that he'd be mad at me if I acted like it hurt. But I was six years old shooting a 12 gauge, and and I remember walking around going, I can't, I can't even cry. He he may make fun of me. I may let him down. This is something I've started to do, and nobody in my family knows that I'm doing it, so I'm sort of being uh, covert about it. <laughs> As I record our big meals, 
just like the tapes that I found of my personal history from back in the early 60s. It would be of Christmas morning opening gifts, Thanksgiving dinners, and the big occasions. And I started to record those, not because I want to listen to them today, but maybe people down the road 20 or 30 years may get a charge out of hearing what was going on. And you sort of get a feel of that from listening to Edgar. You said he was quite the sportsman out of necessity. Absolutely. You have become quite the sportsman yourself. Out of passion. We have not talked about your career at all, but I think that it's interesting how something that happens when you're seven, eight, nine years old can influence you in your career today. You know, we we talk about imprinting in the wildlife uh, side of this business, and but you know we're doing it to people too. I mean, we're making a difference. He got you started. But you had to follow the road yourself. I always make the joke that when I was an 18-year-old, one of my closest friends was Teddy Paul Markham, was a game warden with with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and he'd take me out and let me ride and patrol with him. That was back in the old days when they gave him a radio, a gun, and they drove their own personal vehicle. And uh, we'd go check trout stockings in Buffalo Creek, and we'd do those things, and that was the passion that I wanted to do that so bad. It shaped my life. I always tell a story. It took 26 years to get back to fish and wildlife, but I made it. So There are some copies of this now on CD. That's correct. You've given this now, I trust, to several people. I've given it to my, to my brother and my two sisters. I've got those copies, and I even gave one to one of my best friends who didn't know the guy, but we he just heard it and wanted to, wanted to hear it, wanted a copy of it. So It's absolutely classic. That is true Kentucky. That's true history of Hank well, Patton. It is. What kind of reaction have they had about the same one that i had charlie they a tear down their cheek well hank i appreciate you coming out i'm glad i've got to hear it well i appreciate you doing it for me we will have some more on protecting some of these old audio archives of our life when our program continues this is kentucky afield radio this is charlie bagman on kentucky afield radio Christmas gift-giving is on a lot of people's mind these days. Kids like new things, new music, new games, new stuff. The older we get, however, the more we appreciate the way it was. Old decorations, old recipes, old photographs, the old stories. How that plays into our 21st century lives, we'll ask the Kentucky Oral History Commission. First up, our fishing report. This is Charlie Baglin on Kentucky Field Radio. To know where you're going kind of helps to know where you've been. An intriguing conversation, I'm sure, with the Kentucky Oral History Commission after the break. Christmas means deer season in more ways than one. Have the Jolly Reindeer drop off the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife gift certificate. Perfect for anyone on your list who has hunting on theirs. Find it at fw.ky.gov. Dear Santa, you probably never expected to hear from an old fellow like me, but I too have a list. Some folks are coming to visit me. It's been quite a while since I've seen my son and grandson. They're always ripping and racing going someplace, but this Christmas, they're just racing to see me. So, Mr. Kringle, let them arrive safe. That's all. A holiday wish for safe travels from your Kentucky office of highway safety. We are back, and my name is Charlie Baglin. You're listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. The theme of the show is sort of a blast from the past. In the first half hour, we talked about finding old recordings around our homes from when our parents were young and had these newfangled gadgets called tape recorders, and they would record everything, Christmas dinners, Personal thoughts. Before the rest of the show, we want to look at that from a more formal perspective. From the Kentucky Oral History Commission, part of the Kentucky Historical Society, we welcome Administrator Sarah Milligan and current Chairman Dr. Richard Taylor. What is the history of oral history? Is there a difference between an old recording of, say, the Hindenburg disaster? Is that oral history, or is it... Oral history is something else. Oral history is actually a defined discipline of study with set guidelines. Oral history, in order for it to be an oral history as defined by those guidelines, it has to be recorded in either audio or video. It has to be at least two people talking. So 
for example, me sitting down with somebody else for a specific reason that we're going to have that conversation that's recorded. So it has to be about a historical topic, an event in time, a profession, an occupation, something very specific. It has to be at least two people. It can't just be me handing someone a tape recorder and saying, all those stories that you've told me for the last 10 years, I'd love it if you just recorded those. I'll be back in an hour. <laughs> just talk to yourself. Why wouldn't that be considered oral history? Because I, I too, I remember sitting down with my grandfather and saying, tell me those stories about you uh, walking up and down the river. And Were you there listening to him whenever you recorded it and asking him questions? No, he was telling me the stories. It's not that that is not a history that is given orally. It's just not this discipline of oral history. Part of my job is to do outreach in the state to train people on how to do oral history interviews. And you want to get the most holistic picture of what that event or that time or that story that you're specifically sitting down with them. So it's to ask those questions of how did that feel? What did that look like? What did that smell like when you were doing that? You know, to get the sensory, really understand what that experience was by listening to someone tell the story. Maybe they've told it throughout their entire life, but by really intensely listening to what they're saying and not saying, you can ask pointed questions to help draw out the larger picture of those events. It seems, and Richard, I'll point this question to you. It seems that until the dawn of the printing press, oral history was basically all we had. Am I right? Word of mouth? Right, right. So you're speaking about pre-literate cultures and the history technically is the recorded past, and, and, and that suggests something that has, in some way or another, a degree of permanency about it. What little we know in Kentucky that comes to us, other than through the official, documented, printed record, comes through, through diaries, through journals, and through Shane and through Draper, who were two individuals who, in, in some ways, were the first oral historians, though they had no, the only means they had to record the people they spoke to was the written word. And unfortunately, in some instances, they doctored or altered that in some way. The problem is there are a number of questions we'd like to ask that we can't ask now. But really, oral history, the uniqueness is that you can get a first-person account of that event or that lifestyle, and you hear that person tell how it happened in their memory from their personal perception in their own words, in their own voice. And then later on, you can go back and, you know, if that's your grandfather, like you were talking about, if you'd recorded stories with your grandfather about him telling you the things that he remembers from being a kid and maybe things that his parents and grandparents told him as well, that's something that you can go back to and visit and relive from his perspective, not from the way that you remember him telling it. Richard, you're the poet laureate of Kentucky, or were. What, what or, years were those? Uh, 1999 to 2001. You like to tell stories. You're a professor. I've heard you teach. You enjoy history. It's, it's, it's clear. You have a Ph.D. in English. You right. like language, and you like the telling of stories. I can see this is a natural fit for you at the Oral History Commission. History, too often, it writes, let's say, in broad strokes, and it covers uh, significant public events. I think oral history, in many respects, not only encompasses those events, but gives us an image of more ordinary the lives of more ordinary citizens as they relate to the, the historical context around them. Richard, let me ask you a question, because I may have a skewed vision of this. The farther we go back in time, I want to say we lead a little simpler life. I'm wanting to say a little closer we get to the land having to garden for our food, having to hunt and fish for our food. Sure. And I think it's important that as our lives become increasingly complex and sort of driven by technology, it surprises me just uh, working with, with young people how spotty and fragmentary their knowledge of anything beyond their own birth year is. 
what is lost in not finding the means to recover that somehow. And speaking of recovering what we've lost, earlier we were talking with a man who had discovered an old cassette tape from the middle 70s. On it were some old home recordings that had really brought back some treasured memories from when he was just a little boy. Sarah Richard, I'm telling you now, he could have found a million dollars and not been any happier. In a minute, I want to get your comments on this type of old recording that many of us have. But first, Sarah, you brought a clip that illustrates that discipline of recording and oral history. Set this up for us. In the mid-70s, uh, the first thing the Kentucky Oral History Commission did was they put a tape recorder in every single public library in, or every county public library in the state. So we get, put 120 tape recorders out there. And out of those 120 tape recorders, we got recordings back from 116 counties. And this recording is actually from that project. It was from the Marshall County Collection. Um, the recording was done in 1977 with a man named Gilbert Woodruff. And so you think back, he's talking about being a kid in the 1920s. He's talking about his memories of hunting. But this small clip part that I pulled out was um, him talking about what he did with all the pelts that he collected. Hmm. What they were used for once they left his hands is just great. So back when you were a boy, the, what was the main thing that you liked to hunt for in those days? Rabbit and squirrel and possum. That's the only way that I got into Christmas money was And that was to eat? Uh, I, I didn't eat them much. My daddy ate them. He liked them. But I got to hide. Oh, brother. Did you uh, do your own uh, curing of the hides? We'll skin them. You might take boards. Put a board off. The shape, about the shape you want your hide. Stretch it over that and let it dry. And then who bought those hides? Uh... They had some local buyers around through the country. Some shipped them to Funston and S.C. Taylor. Sears and Roebuck went to buy them. They had several. Oh, there's lots of fur companies. The biggest part of them was in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. uh, other than Sears and Roebuck, they bought them in the Chicago store for a long time. But after they set up a place in Memphis, well, us people here had to send them to Memphis for closer to to Chicago. Did you ever do any trapping? Not, not, not no trapping. I never was no trapper. Mm -hmm. Always just hunted. Mm -hmm. Had a pretty good dog. What did they do with those hides? Make furs for coats. Mm How -hmm. about the possum furs? Well, you see, they had dime and make anything out of them. Oh, to them. Mm -hmm. There's been a many a little possum sold for a mink. <laughs> they just died and made anything out of them. to them. I see. Well, a lot of them old timers would take a coon hide and make a, make a cap out of it. I like listening to that. There's been many a possum skin sold as a mink. Sold as a mink. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's priceless. <laughs> yeah. That's classic. But I'll bet his story was probably very similar to many kids mm -hmm. of the era. They would do odds and end things with that there may be wild game laws against today, mm -hmm. but they did that for the extra money they needed at the time. Oh, yeah, it's really interesting. There's a lot of interviews that were done in the, that 70s, 1980s time period where you hear people talking about the progression of wildlife in their area of the state has been, you know, back when they remember there weren't any deer or turkeys, you know, and talking about what they did hunt when they were kids or where they went fishing or what they fished for and the, the changing ways even that they had to do that because of laws and regulations changing or different wildlife being introduced. It is really interesting. Once upon a time, my girlfriend's daddy worked in Louisville. This had to be the late 50s. He was a good guy. He worked filling the vending machines with lifesavers and gum, candy bars. And one of the stops along his route included a place where a very young Cassius Clay had a part-time job sweeping up, I think the story goes. Anyway, he called Pam's daddy Candyman. And it's little tidbits like that that show us some of the fascinating people that we meet along the way. Heavyweight champion of the world, athlete of the century, Muhammad Ali. None of that stuff existed then. This was the 50s. He was just, you know, just a young kid boxer with a dream. And he called my would-have-been father-in-law Candyman. We still love telling that story. 
What I wish, however, is that I could have had a tape recorder and sat down and say, Lloyd, tell me that story. Where were you? When was this? Tell me the specifics. Absolutely, especially with oral history. The closer you can get to an event, um, I'm a big proponent of getting the stories from people while they are still able to tell them and as they experience them. Sarah, Dr. Taylor, when we come back, let's spend a few minutes talking about some of these older recordings, old tapes that we uh, unearth from our life and what we might be able to do to listen to them, to preserve them. Could get interesting. My name is Charlie Baglin, and you are listening to Kentucky Field Radio. We are back in our closing segment of Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and we're talking to a couple of folks who represent the Kentucky Oral History Commission, part of the Kentucky Historical Society. Administrator Sarah Milligan and chair of the commission, Dr. Richard Taylor, welcome to you both. People record their stories, or we will find these old tapes. Perhaps we have them in our basement someplace or in a bottom drawer, and we've always wondered what they were and never really knew. Is there an enduring medium that you have found that will preserve audio so that generations with one little apparatus, whatever that is, can play it? No, but to expand that a little bit, this is something that archives, librarians, all the, the people who actually deal with making sure that the media that you create today will be preserved in the future deal with on a daily basis. Um, when you're talking about just a small cassette tape, you know, that maybe you recorded in the 80s, the lifespan of those, if they're being kept in a relatively steady humidity and temperature controlled space and maybe brought out once every five years or so and run back and forth, is about 35 years. And that's actually a pretty long lifetime for when you're talking about analog audio or video media. Reel-to-reels actually have a little bit longer lifespan than that. They're a little bit more steady. Tape in general seems to be one of the backup media that people still use, even for digital content. There isn't a physical medium that you can put those onto that's going to make sure that you can play them back, as you said, 30 years from now. The business that libraries and archives are in is making sure that those digital files and analog files converted to digital medium will be available 50 years from now, 100 years from now. And the only way to do that is to stay on top of what the, the technological trends are. And that's a big task, but it's something as an archive we've committed ourselves to doing. And so once we get all of those cassettes migrated to a digital medium, onto a server, onto a hard drive, um, we have to do it in a format that 10 years from now when that file format is no longer usable, we can easily migrate it over to whatever is the best standard at that time. good friend of mine was in Vietnam back in the day, mm -hmm. and he had a reel-to-reel -reel recorder and would sit down and talk about his life there and what he saw and what he did and the goings-on of uh, Vietnam life. And I think he sent these back to Kentucky to his mother. He didn't have the technology to play a reel-to-reel -reel tape anymore. They were sitting in his attic. He threw them away. Oh, my heart is breaking right now. <laughs> in fact, that reminds me of a collection that we had donated to us maybe in the last two or three years by someone doing military oral histories who looked in her own family closet and saw that they had these recordings on reel-to-reel -reel tape from when she and her two siblings were little kids and her dad was deployed to Vietnam and he would audio record a letter and send it home. They would get together and play on the reel-to-reel -reel recorder and send it back and then this would go back and forth and instead of writing letters they recorded these little kind of what's happening in the day. So it would be the kids sitting around maybe singing a song or I mean, you could hear him be tired, you could hear him be homesick, you could hear him be excited, all those different things. The heart-wrenching part of that story was that he was actually killed in action the day before he was supposed to come mm -hmm. home. And so these kids, what they grew up with from their dad, were having these recordings that they could, you know, once every 10 years, they would bring out and kind of replay and, and feel this connection to their dad. Those recordings, personal diaries and journals on tape as well, are, are very valuable. That was a part of my life. I found some tapes that I'd know what I'd always had. And then I realized I have the capability to put these in a digital medium. And when I listened back to them, 
it was a February day, and I said, my Christmas shopping is done. <laughs> I know now what I'm giving my sisters for Christmas. It took six or eight months to go through every one of them, every piano recital and every birthday, every Christmas. That, mm -hmm. good or bad, is our history. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have these tapes. Is there a message that you can give to people to encourage them to maybe dig through those boxes, see what's in there? Oh, yeah. If you don't feel like that you have the comfort level to digitize those, there are places that definitely can do it for a fee, or sometimes there's places in your community where you can do that. They have that equipment available just for general use. For example, there's the Northside Library in Lexington has a audio studio where you can bring your tapes in and learn how to just digitize them there in the library. Yeah. Remember that 35-year mark, and that 35-year mark is really archival condition for that cassette tape. So if you're seeing a cassette tape in a drawer somewhere in your bedroom or in your basement and especially in your attic, go up and find it and give me a call, and I'll point you in the right direction. I mean, this is part of what I do on a daily basis is help people walk through what it is that they have that's this medium and whether it can be preserved, whether you want to keep it for your own family or whether you want to talk about placing it in an archive for public accessibility. Kentucky Historical Society, the Oral History Commission, certainly want to get it accurate. If you brought 10 people in and said, tell me a story about what happened, you will get 10 different stories. Yeah. Do you have to look for the commonalities in the story and do those emerge as the truth? Or are there 10 legitimate different stories? Well, it is a tough question. Each of us perceives things in different ways, and if we're looking for, at the viewpoint of the individual, what we report is the truth for us. And so you're suggesting that there is an objective truth, and in many ways I think objective truth is a goal more than it is a reality. I've often thought that historians are approximators of the truth, there is this distortion which comes particularly when you rely on a very narrow base of sources. However, if you have multiple sources, if you interview, you could interview every survivor on the uh, Arizona, you could get a much fuller, much more accurate picture and you could distill what's been said in order to gain a sense of, of what in fact the truth is. But I'm not sure that the truth is ultimately ascertainable. It can only be approximated. Well, I thank you all for coming by. This has been interesting. Uh, There's a question I always ask. Do you text and drive? No. No. Do you know what texting I, is? For I do know what texting is. In <laughs> fact, it's next on my list for my children to show me. You know, the truth <laughs> is, I'm not much interested in texting. <laughs> well, I hope that that truth is objective and not just approximated. From the Kentucky Oral History Commission, Sarah Milligan and Commission Chair Dr. Richard Taylor. Let me give a web address if you would like to probe further on the oral spoken histories of Kentucky. Passtheword.ky.gov. Again, passtheword.ky.gov. I'm Charlie Baglin. Join us again in a week. We will go inside outdoors again here on Kentucky Field Radio.